you're welcome here this morning. And I thought before we start today, we, we would read a psalm. This is Psalm 96, and it says like this. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. So I invite you to sing with us if you want to sing this morning, but also if you want to stay there and close your eyes and just look at the lyrics and meditate, you're welcome to do so as well. So let's sing this morning. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Oh, 
You are holy, Lord. And we worship you this morning. So we're making our way through the book of Colossians uh, and we've been given a picture of Christ, a breathtaking picture of Christ as the creator of the universe. All things were made by him and through him and for him. He holds all things together. He's the head of the church and the church will display his character, the kind of God he is. The church will display that to the world. And Paul is going to continue to celebrate Jesus in whom all the fullness of God dwells. But first, there's a surprising twist. So Paul has just said, we will just read this again. This is God's word to us. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, his church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. And then we read in verses 19 and 20, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, that repeated phrase again, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So, if you are new to this story, this isn't what you would expect. 
So we've just read in the earlier verses that the Creator has made it all, that He's over it all, He holds it all together. It was made for Him. But now we read, He reconciles to Himself all things, the same words, heaven and earth. How could it be that reconciliation was needed? Like He was the foundation of it all, holding it all together, and now He has to reconcile all things, all of it, to Himself. Like the question is, how is it that reconciliation is needed? That if you like, peace is needed to be made between humanity and God. You have to ask, how can that be? Somehow, creation, including humanity, got broken. And he, Jesus, has had to fix it. And this too is a point of celebration of the greatness and a vision of God our King. Remember, Paul is trying to get us to think magnificently about Jesus. And we think magnificently about Jesus when we see him as he really is. So the question is, how did things get so bad? How did things break down so much that reconciliation was needed? And Paul goes on to explain in verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. So verse 21 is is painting that picture, once alienated from God. And in a sense, you know, alienated from God, I kind of live with that. It doesn't sound too bad because you often hear people who used to be friends and they become alienated or estranged from each other. They're just not close anymore. And probably all of us have people like that in our lives. And I could see that happening with humanity and God. Like, you know, they're just not close anymore. Each went their own way, or humanity went its own way. But the next phrase, enemies in my mind towards God. Like, was I ever that? Were you ever that? Enemies in your mind towards God. Like, I didn't feel that bad, that evil, because that sounds evil, that hostile towards God. I, I was actually quite nice. I had a few rough edges, a little selfish, a little mean little unforgiving. But to think that I was behaving and thought in a way that was at the level of God's enemy, that seems a bit extreme, at least to me. I'm, I'm nice. But maybe, this is where we need to think about our thinking, maybe we think we need to understand that we're a created being and we're being told something by the Creator and that He sees what we don't see. It's a bit like going to the doctor because you have a pain in your stomach and you're convinced all you have is indigestion. But he looks at you and straight away says, you've got cancer, we need to operate. You trust the doctor, even though he's got bad news, because living in denial isn't a good option when you have cancer. It doesn't help to ignore reality. So let's look some more at this reality of being God's enemies in our minds. Remember, the the enemies is from our side. We're, in our minds, enemies towards God. F.F. Bruce, who's a leading scholar in the last century, he died in 1990, he wrote an expanded paraphrase of all Paul's letters. And he paraphrases verse 21. Once you were estranged from God, I can live with that, but he goes on to say, cherishing hostility to God in your minds because of your wicked deeds cherishing hostility to God in our minds. This is like going from bad to worse. Cherishing cherishing hostility to God, cherishing it. Like I looked up in a thesaurus, what you could swap the word cherishing for, and it's like cultivating, cultivating hostility towards God, or treasuring hostility towards God, or revering hostility towards God. That sounds really bad. That's like a cancer diagnosis of the soul. And it won't do to ignore that. I tried to imagine in my mind what the attitude of mind and heart would look like that's hostile towards someone and apply that to God. What would it look like to cherish hostility towards someone? And this picture that's on the screen now might capture it. That picture portrays the way we were towards God. And it actually affected all of creation 
because of our unique role in creation. So although all of creation needs reconciling, we're the focal point of that reconciliation because it is our hostility towards the Creator that brought around about the need for the reconciliation. Peace is needed, an end of hostilities. That's what needs to be created. We're not talking about an inner peace, but a peace between humanity and God because we're hostile towards Him. Remember that picture of the angry fan. So then you kind of think, how badly did humanity's relationship with God get broken? It actually got broken completely. We have a word in Dublin for something that's completely broken, and it's a great word. The word is banjaxed. This is a picture of a bike that's banjaxed. That's how broken humanity's relationship with God is, how broken your relationship with God is apart from Christ, how broken my relationship is with God apart from Christ. And then you have to happen, okay, if it's broken, how did we end up there? Romans chapter 1 tells us in verse 25, it says they, in other words humanity, meaning us, you and me, we exchanged the truth of God or the truth about God for a lie. So a great exchange happened. We exchanged truth about God for a lie. So how did we do that? How do we exchange the truth about God for a lie? It goes earlier, it says from verse 19, since what may be known about God was plain to humanity, because God made play, it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, they've been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people were without excuse. In other words, what we see in creation points us to God. And he goes on to say, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. So what, Paul is saying is what went wrong with the human condition, what is wrong with the human condition, was that although humanity knew God, knew about God, they didn't glorify him as God. Basically, humanity said, you're not God. We will decide who God is. We will make our own gods. And they exchanged the truth that God is God for a lie. We will decide who God is. And once you step out of reality about God, who is the fundamental reality, the creator of it all, every part of you begins to spiral out of control into chaos and darkness. And us, as the intended pinnacle and rulers of creation, creation ended up itself needing reconciliation, impacted by our exchanging the truth of God for a lie. And the outcome of that exchanging the truth of God for a lie is outlined in Romans 29 to 31. It's not meant to be exhaustive, it just paints a picture. He says, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, in other words, they got rid of the truth of God and started living a lie. So God said, well, if that's what you want, I will give you freedom to do that. So he gave them over to what they wanted, a depraved mind, so that they would do what ought not to be done. They've become filled with every kind of wickedness and evil and greed and depravity. They are full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Can you see yourself there apart from Jesus? Maybe not in the murder part, how about the gossips part? Or lacking in mercy towards some person or some group of people that you think they don't deserve mercy? Or how about being envious of the success of others or the ease of life of others? Or strife between people, within families, within friends? Can you see yourself there? then maybe this idea of cherishing hostility towards God is an accurate diagnosis of humanity. And then, when you drill down deeper into this lie, the exchange of God for some other God, we will decide who God is. And you know who we decide who God is? Us. Paul makes it clear 
who the other God is. We become our own God. We become the center of our own life. Our wants, our desires, our likes, they're paramount. And when we don't get what we want, we complain and we grumble and we hurt others by what we say or what we do and how we act. You see, the lie is that we are God. Our desires, our needs, our wants are central to everything. In Colossians chapter 3, later on in this same letter, Paul will call greed, what I want in other words, is idolatry. And in Philippians chapter 3, verse 19, Paul describes humanity as their God is their belly, meaning their God is their desires, if you like, the feeling center of them. So this kind of ruined condition, this lostness, this lie is rejecting God as God and making ourselves God in his place. So let me show you a picture of who my God is apart from me surrendering to Jesus. Here is a picture of my idol, my God, the center of my life. It's all self-worship what John Tyson calls Project Self. We reject God as God, and in his, place we play, we, in his place we place us, the God called Project Self. Now that can be really hard to see because we're still mainly nice people most of the time. But my decisions, my choices, how I spend my time, who I decide I want to hang around with, how I spend my energy, my money, is all about me, my comfort, my ease, my security, my bucket list, my wish list, my convenience. So my wishes and my desires become the center of my life. They become God. They become first. You see, they aren't bad things in and of themselves. It's just they have become, in this lie, exchanging the truth for a lie, they have become the first thing. Apart from Jesus, my God is Project Self. And we all need rescuing from Project Self. You see, it's not that humanity stopped believing in God. We still want God to be there and to step in to help us to make our circumstances better, to make our life the way it should be. As Dallas Willard says, wanting God to be God in my life is very different from wanting God to help me. Wanting God to help me makes me the center of my life. That God will do exactly what I want. Wanting God to be God in my life is to live in reality and fullness. Wanting God to help me have the life I want is just a religious version of Project Self. It's exchanging the truth of God for a lie. If you think about it, no wonder we cherished hostility towards God in our hearts. How dare he want to be God in our lives? Like, who does he think he is anyway? God? Now, if you think about the fact that while we, you and me, were cherishing hostility in our hearts towards God, what was God cherishing? What was he treasuring? God was treasuring you and me. While we were treasuring hostility, he was treasuring us. What kind of being does that? Cherishing those who are hostile to him. Who is this God? That's a kindness. That's a type of life that isn't of this world. And it's shown to you and me. And how did God show us this type of life, this type of love, this type of cherishing? How did he demonstrate it? while we were still his enemies. Romans 5 makes it clear. Verses 6 to 8. You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, still cherishing hostility towards God, Christ died for the ungodly, for you and me. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, cherishing hostility towards him in our minds, Christ died for us. While you and me were treasuring hostility towards God, he was cherishing you and me. That is the kind of God we have, 
That is what he has done. That is why it is so important to understand who he actually is, to allow us to think magnificently of him, because he is truly magnificent. He has acted magnificently towards you and me. Just like Romans 1 tells us our condition apart from Christ and before Christ, Romans 8 tells us about our condition, about us after this reconciliation. And it goes on, and this is a paraphrase, if God is on our side, who can be against us? Because he's on our side, revealed by Jesus on the cross. Who can bring any charge against God's chosen people? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Jesus Christ who died, or rather who's been raised from the dead, is the one who is at the Father's right hand, making intercession for us as our advocate. Who will separate us from God's love? And he goes on to say, I am utterly assured that nothing, neither death nor life or anything, any other created thing can ever separate us from God's love, which is ours in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen and hallelujah. So, enemies, the cross, God is for us. So if you hold Romans 1 and Romans 8 up, enemies become sons and daughters. When we're rejecting God, God is accepting us in Christ. When we were against God, he was for us. It's on the cross, ultimately, that the character of God is displayed, full of mercy and forgiveness, full of justice and compassion for you and me. And Paul is saying, this is your God, a God like no other, Christ in whom all the fullness of God dwells. This is the Jesus Paul knows and wants us to know and to get life from. Like we've seen last week, a creator of limitless, limitless power and creativity, a being of infinite mercy and justice, who became incarnate, became flesh and blood, took on the punishment of all our sin and shame, and now offers to those who simply are desperate enough to put their confidence in him, he offers them newness of life, his kind of life. And all this is helping us to understand who Jesus really is, so as that we can understand and respond to the boundless riches of Christ. And this reconciliation, you think, okay, the end of hostility, it's much more than the end of hostility. Listen to verse 22. Now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So he, God, acted so that you could stand before him holy, in other words, set apart unto him, without blemish and free from accusation. King James Version says, you are unblameable. It doesn't mean that you don't sin, it's just you are unblameable because you are in Christ. Christ has covered all that. It's kind of like the image I have in my mind, I don't know if this is a good idea or not, but you know those non-stick Teflon pans? Well, through what Christ has done and your confidence in that, you are Teflon when it comes to blame in God's eyes. Not that you don't sin, but you're Teflon when it comes to blame and condemnation. And all that is gift. All simply trusting in what Jesus has won for you. There really is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, not because you don't sin, but because you have a new kind of life. And in that kind of life, you stand unblameable before God through what Jesus has done, because the blame and the condemnation for all that you've done has already been dealt with and placed on Jesus. What we need to do is to fill our minds with who Jesus really is, creator of infinite power, head of the church of which we are the body, meaning he is the source of power and identity and life for the church. He is the one who reconciles all things to himself through his death on the cross. He is the one who is for you. And then Paul goes on in verse 23. He says, all this is true. And then there's, this might seem like a scary condition. If you continue in the faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. But it's not 
supposed to be scary. It's actually supposed to encourage. Paul is saying, you know what? You depended on Jesus be to be saved, to come into the family, to be forgiven, to be reconciled. You place your confidence in Jesus and what he has done. Just keep placing your confidence there. That's what he's saying. But if you decide that what Jesus has done isn't enough, if that you need to earn God's approval, then you're kind of walking away what Jesus is offering. It's not that Jesus takes it away, it's you decide you don't want it. You want to build your own life before God, build your own acceptance in God's eyes, rather than receiving God's acceptance through Christ. But what's so cool is that we have come to know him and we have a growing confidence in him. And as we think about who Jesus really is, as Paul has described in these last verses, that confidence will grow. And then a God that is that big and that kind gives us confidence to trust him in the outcome of all the situations of our life, in the outcome of our whole life. When we have a God who is that good, we can surrender our will to his. We can get off the throne of Project Self and allow Jesus to be on the throne of our life. Actually, it would be really foolish not to. So let me give you something to think about and treasure. Firstly, to think about what areas of your life because is still living Project Self? Because actually it's a process of getting off the throne of your life, of tearing down your idols. So where is it that your wants, your desires, your agenda is the focal point of your life? And what do you need to do to begin to take down that idol so that Jesus becomes your focal point in that area of your life? And uh, something to treasure and think about and mull about and keep in your mind all week. While you were cherishing hostility towards God, he was cherishing you. He has reconciled you to himself for eternity. And to end, I would just like to finish by reading the entire hymn to Christ that Paul wrote, all the way back to verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. And then to reconcile us to himself, that while we were still treasuring hostility, God's... Paul writes about Jesus, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on heaven or on earth, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. I live for 
Let us adore Him. 